Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, for more than a generation, small town downtowns have struggled with changing demographics and with shopping trends. But that doesn't mean the future of Main Street includes a wrecking ball. This week on Oklahoma Horizon, we'll see how a national celebrity is helping her local town People one purchase like at a this. time. We spent the year leading up to opening making sure that every aspect of the mercantile is worth it for anyone who wants to drive. We'll visit with a rural revitalization expert on how small towns can keep their main streets viable. So maybe sometimes you can give them a little bit of a financial sting. Some towns have actually passed mm -hmm. ordinances that charge more for letting a building sit unoccupied or sit in storage. And we end our day with a taste of Italy in small town Oklahoma. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech, a job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Rob McClendon. Well, it can be a struggle for small town downtowns. Everything from increased competition from a big box retailer a town over to just changing shopping habits can make it difficult for local retailers. But you sure can't tell it these days in the small northern Oklahoma town of Pahuska. During the Osage oil boom in the early 20th century, Pahuska, Oklahoma, per capita, was the wealthiest town in the world. In fact, it was the home of the first Rolls-Royce dealership west of the Mississippi. Even a very young Clark Gable roughnecked in the oil patch nearby. But as oil booms go, there was a bust and Pahuska's population began a steady decline. But today, fans of the Pioneer Woman can swell this small town of 3,500 to five times that size on any given day, thanks to a local celebrity's return to her family's merchant roots. Well, the lines can get long at the Pioneer Woman Mercantile in Pahuska, Oklahoma, thanks in great part to the celebrity surrounding Reed Drummond, better known as the Pioneer Woman. Welcome to my frontier. Um, I started my blog in 2006. It was nothing. It was a small personal blog about daily life on the ranch. Didn't even have any recipes. But it did have a certain feel that attracted readers by the hundreds of thousands. I don't take myself too seriously. Don't debate politics or, or religion or, or things like that that people can get anywhere. It's just kind of a slice of life and I think everybody enjoys family, food, you know, humor. That runs through every word she writes. Just look at the subheader on her website. Plowing through life in the country, one calf nut at a time something we got to experience firsthand when Ree was a couple hours late for our interview, and for good reason. We had controlled burning on the ranch, and the fire jumped a road that it wasn't supposed to jump, which happens a lot. Um, we actually had some lodge tours going on out on the ranch. A bunch of Merck guests came out to check it out, so I wound up rounding them all up and having them follow me out the back door <laughs> to the ranch. So do you ever snicker when someone questions your authenticity? <laughs> yes. Well, just like today. I mean, this is my life for the past 20 years. You know, you make plans and then um, your husband lights a little match and, and then you have to take 15 strangers out the back way of the ranch. And as I said, I've, I've, <laughs> I've been doing this for the past 20 years of my life. So it's funny. And successful. From her wildly popular blog came a cookbook then a variety of other books and her own TV show on the Food Network. All giving a peek into her life on a working cattle ranch. You know, I never thought of myself as a writer when I started a blog. I really just started blogging. You just have to start writing and just like anything, whether it's cooking or photography or any hobby or skill, you will get better 
the more you do it. So blogging is great for that because it's a daily thing. And it was for me, I was a serious seven day a week blogger for probably two or three years when I first started. I guess I had a lot to say <laughs> after living in the country for 10 years. Quite the photographer. Have you always had a good eye? Oh no, 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 no. I was terrible when I first started taking pictures. But again, the same thing, I wanted to learn how to take pictures. So I got a big girl camera, I called it. Um, took my first few pictures and I thought, well, they're not any good and this is a really nice camera. So I just started taking pictures every day. And before long, I would get one good picture out of a hundred. And then I'd get two or three good pictures. So it's just anything you do daily, you're gonna get better. How important is place for you, that being here in the Osage Hills, how important is that? Oh gosh, well it's home. You know, I was born in Bartlesville, so I wasn't born too far away. But now, you know, Pahuska really is my home. It's where my kids were born, and it's, we're dug in here, and th this is where our roots are. My husband's family has lived here for generations, so it's, it's very important. You know, when we were thinking about doing the mercantile and as the idea evolved we never once considered doing it anywhere but here even though it might have made a little more demographic sense <laughs> to build it in a larger locale it wouldn't have made sense for us to do it anywhere else but i think probably just the past few months have shown that if you build it they will come i'm just so grateful for every person that drives here whether they're driving from tulsa or another state because they are kind of taking a chance on you know whether the experience is going to be worth it and so um, my husband and I and, and the people that that helped us with this we spent the year leading up to opening making sure that every aspect of the mercantile is worth it for anyone who wants to drive. That includes customer service. Elizabeth Keyes works in the bakery and moved here from Arkansas. I really love it. It's, I mean, it's such a fun atmosphere to work in and it's just a really great company to work for. Honestly, I love working here. With close to 200 employees, the Pioneer Woman Mercantile has become a major employer for this small town. My husband's great, great grandfather um, immigrated from Scotland and he actually was a merchant. He wasn't a rancher. This building itself was not his store but this was the original Osage Mercantile in Pahuska. So there are roots kind of on both sides, both in my husband's family and in the town. So um, I've always loved the idea of an old general store. I, I, don't, I don't know where or how many times I've seen pictures of you know the, the cabinets and the men standing around in their uniforms waiting on people. Little House on the Prairie, the Olson Mercantile, I just had a clear vision that I wanted this store to harken back to um, another time and place. But turning a vision into reality is a job unto itself. And something Reed Drummond is quick to point out she didn't do alone. I shudder to imagine where we would be if Career Tech had not gotten involved in the days and weeks leading up to the Merck opening. They were unbelievably instrumental. I mean, I could go on and on, but they're basically our heroes. We had this warehouse full of product for the store, and before we brought it over to the store, of course, everything had to be tagged and priced. And so we spent days, I think at least a couple of weeks, um, meticulously tagging product, and everything was 70 to 80% done. And then we found out to our horror that the system had tagged everything with exactly the same barcode and price, which we wouldn't have known by just looking at the tags. So it was just a little bit of a hidden glitch. And we were completely panicked. We, we didn't know what to do. And Career Tech literally swooped in with their Superman capes on, <laughs> brought a busload of helpers and they spent however much time they needed to re-tag everything. And I mean, I, I, as I say, I shudder to imagine where we would have been on opening day if, if that busload hadn't shown up and helped us. And since that opening day, the crowds just continue to grow.
Now, if you'd like to plan a visit, Thursday through Saturday are their busiest days, and the Mercantile is closed on Sunday, but there's still plenty to do in the area, and the Pahuska Chamber has it all lined out well on their website, which we do have a link to under this story at okhorizon.com. Now, when we return, building upon the success of the Pioneer Woman. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Well, the opening of the Pioneer Woman Mercantile is a huge event in and of itself. But what about the bigger picture? How are businesses, people, and the city of Pahuska affected by this big name attracting all the crowds? In a word, it's thankful, but also mindful they need to build upon the Pioneer Woman's success. Our Blaine Singletary has their story. The Mercantile might be bringing everyone to the small, once quiet town of Mahuska, but it's far from the only place those people are going. They're standing in line, and while they're standing in line, one person holds the place in line and the rest of them come shop. That's Kathy Ball. She runs a clothing shop inside the Tallgrass Gallery, just across the street from the Pioneer Woman Mercantile. And while things are bustling today, she still has fresh memories of the store's humble beginnings. I've been here for five and a half years. There was a group of eight women that had separate booths in a little store two doors down. And we just tried to provide things that weren't in the town. There was no place to buy clothing. Now, with tens of thousands of people flocking to Bahuska every month since the Merck opened in November, Businesses like Kathy's have had a slew of new customers they've been all too happy to accommodate. So it's been amazing. Uh, we help them with information around town about where to go and what to do. And they say that once the money comes into a town, it passes at least three times through the town before it's gone. So everybody's benefiting from it. Obviously that does improve the foot traffic for your community. You get a lot of tourists in. They get to see the other things that are happening here. Bruce Carver is the owner of the Tall Grass Gallery. So all ships rise with the tide. The tide's risen, but it's up to us to keep it going. The opening of the Mercantile might have changed this downtown district overnight, but taking advantage of this sudden growth spurt is going to take a lot of continued effort. I think that for a small town, sometimes the stars have to align. But those stars don't align without people working in the background and having a vision or a goal Pahuska probably for 12, 13 years has been trying to become an arts destination. And I think what happened here is with Reed Drummond, the stars aligned and we were able to make that happen. But it's been people working in the background, working hard, have, believing yes. in something. We don't talk about visions in Pahuska anymore, we talk about goals. You know, we don't talk about problems, we talk about creative opportunities. And one of the many people working in the background on those goals and opportunities is Joni Nash, Executive Director of the Pahuska Chamber of Commerce. It all goes back to just a, a, a spirit of excitement and anticipation of, of what's going on now, but what's also to come. Like anyone who's come across a major windfall, Nash says the key objective now is not to blow it. All of a sudden we do have all this organic uh, growth and, and stimulation, but we want to maximize the potential. And looking outside, we've tapped into partnering with those resources as far as getting those investors and getting those promoters here um, to, to talk Pahuska outside of Pahuska and bringing the right people here. And of course, all those meals and merchandise serves up a heaping helping of sales tax revenue to the tune of an extra $20,000 per month. Mike McCartney is the Pawhuska City Manager. For, you know, rural communities like ours, um, it means a lot to us. I mean, we, we have to have that to uh, keep everything going. As most communities, um, rural communities in, in the state are struggling right now, and um, it will help us out a bunch. And long before that money started pouring in, the city and its chamber have had a long wish list. We pushed the downtown. We started our uh, streetscape plan back in 2010. So we've been pushing. We could never have gotten to this point, uh, I don't think, uh, at for sure this fast without uh, the Drummonds, you know, stepping up. When we opened our door, it came, and it came fast. And that's why at the top of this list is infrastructure. Mike says some of what's currently in place is estimated to be over 100 years old. 
all these new people need all manner of new facilities. It hasn't really caught us off guard, but you just don't know until uh, they get here just what you're gonna need. Restroom facilities. You have that many people and they're standing in line, they're, they need a restroom at some point through there. Getting back and forth across uh, Main Street, which is Highway 60, uh, we've had to really watch that. Thanks to an ongoing partnership with Tri-County Tech Center, which has already helped train and staff positions in the Merck, they'll be able to facilitate this much needed update for the city, allowing them to focus on their big dreams, like a new bustling downtown with more residential, commercial businesses, and nightlife. And Joni Nash says people can't wait to get started. I have calls uh, constantly now of, of, of interest that are, that are wanting to come to Bahuska and wanting to find out what it takes to get a business downtown. There's really great investors that are stepping up and coming into our community. While change, especially one that's taken hold this fast, is never easy, Bruce Carver says it's essential for this rural community to continue growing and thriving. Without struggle, there's no progress. And sometimes people would like things to remain the same, but things don't remain the same. And I think you would find a very small, small minority in Pahuska are not appreciative of what's happening here. We went from being a very small, rural, backwater community to being Disney World. And you have to pay to do that. It's pay to play. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, not every small town can have their own ready-made celebrity attraction, but what they can do is build upon what they do have. Recently, I sat down with rural revitalization expert Becky McCray to talk about some tips on keeping small town downtowns viable. So Becky, we see a lot of small towns just struggle with empty storefronts. How do you get around that? Every town kind of has their own unique set of challenges. So in one town it might be absentee owners that own the buildings but live somewhere else. In another town it might be the condition of the buildings, that that structure is just not in good shape and you can't get into it. And maybe it might even be that the code compliance requirements are too much, that you, there's just no way to afford to bring it up to code mm -hmm. and then be able to go in there and be in a successful business. Or maybe they're being used for storage. This is really common in small towns. And so there's any number of reasons. Yeah, let's talk a couple of strategies here. What about the absentee owner? How do you get them on board? It's really hard. It's a project. It's a project in human relations. You have to actually connect with them as a person and come to the point that they can understand how important that building is and how important that business is that may get there. Maybe sometimes you can give them a little bit of a financial sting. Some towns have actually passed mm -hmm. ordinances that charge more for letting a building sit unoccupied or sit in storage. Mm -hmm. This actually is one that works really well with those absentee corporate owners that maybe a corporation owns hundreds of buildings in hundreds of different towns. If you make it not pay, then sometimes they'll go ahead and let go of that building. Yeah, I just had a friend trying to bring a business into a certain town and, and he got stymied because the business he's trying to bring in, they just said to him flat out, there's too much vacancy around me. Is that common? A lot of times it gets kind of a critical mass of vacancy and it's just simply hard to overcome the thinking that then gets entrenched. People start thinking, well, we have so much vacancy, there's just no way a business could overcome this. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, you have to start with temporary events and transient things, pop-up businesses and festivals and events and anything you can do to bring life to the downtown on a temporary basis. It will help to eventually fill those buildings and to provide a better business environment for any kind of business to go in there. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting, especially with some of the, the these temporary buildings you're talking about. You may have a burned out building yeah. that you can bring a temporary you know, building inside and you've got a facility then. Yeah, in Paris, Texas, there's a building that it burned out, so there's just a shell. And so they've saved that front facade. So it looks great from the front that there's still the brick facade there. Well, the inside was burned out. Well, they paved it back. They made it nice enough on the inside for seating, brought in a temporary building just to be the kitchen area, and now it's a beer garden. Wow, I wanna take you back to the empty buildings. What can you do if you just can't get a building 
occupied. Divide it up. Instead of looking for one tenant to fill all 15,000 square feet, divide it up and look for tenants who can fill 400 square feet with something unique, niche oriented, and that's an experience. And then when you have multiple of those, so you have a dozen of them in one building, that's an interesting and engaging experience and people will come specifically for that. So we know how it's been. Mm -hmm. How do we get where we want it to be when it comes to small town downtown? I always fall back to the innovative rural business models. And these are, that's a name I made up for a set of ways of looking at business that doesn't rely on one person filling the full space. But they are tiny businesses, only covering maybe a few hundred square feet. Temporary businesses, maybe only in there for a few days, a few weeks, even a few hours during a festival. They are businesses that are together, where you bring lots of businesses so they have, that generate their own uh, critical mass. And finally, also, trucks and trailers, where a business can be based on a mobile platform and can string together enough market through multiple towns. Don't have to rely just on your hometown to be enough to support your business. Mm -hmm. That gives you enough strength to have enough market to make that business work. So tiny, temporary, together, trucks and trailers. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Want to see more stories like this? All our segments are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Well, while the Piner Woman Mercantile in Pahuska prides itself on having a little bit of everything, La Vera's Handcrafted Foods in Krebs, Oklahoma has taken a different approach of doing just a few things, but doing them very well. Austin Moore explains. For those travelers in search of the best cuisine, Italy is likely at the top of the list. The country is famous for wine, pasta, and especially for cheese. But if Italy is out of reach, Krebs, Oklahoma will take you on its own tasty journey. If you go to Rome, you're not going to get a meal like you would in Krebs or vice versa. It's kind of evolved. It's Italian style, but it's evolved from like a depression era Italian. Sam Lavera is the owner of Lavera's Italian Grocery. No, not just as a destination store for Italian ingredients, but also for the sausage they produce and for the cheese. We make world-class cheese here, right here in Oklahoma. Acclaim his cheesemaker and son-in-law, Sean Duffy, can back up. Dar Cacio Cavera cheese, our traditional, was about the best mild provolone in the world in 2012 in England. Um, our smoked cheese, our hickory smoked cheese, just two years ago in Sacramento, California, was about the best smoked cheese in the country. Of course, the story's not really about the cheese. Not really. It's about the jobs. Artisan cheese is very much, in and of itself, a labor-intensive process, and so just innate in its nature is the opportunity to develop jobs and those things because it's very hands-on. So when Laveras wanted to expand their line, the small facility on site wasn't enough. Enter Pontotoc Technology Center and their small business incubator, which normally helps startups grow. Anywhere from IT, from, from computer programs that they use on their, their books, their record keeping, we'd help train their employees if they need uh, soft skills, we do that right here at Pontotoc Technology Center. Herschel Williams works with agriculture business management at Pontotoc. Normally our companies stay here three years. We help them get established and, and get them on their feet and then they move on. The cheese plant people, they'll, they'll be here. The only time they'll leave here if they outgrow this facility and build a bigger facility for them to move to. This facility opens up all sorts of uh, opportunities for us to expand. Uh, hire on new people, bring on new dairies, and that sort of thing. With the installation of a new food grade floor, thanks to the Ada Jobs Foundation, the school board here saw an opportunity to create new jobs for Ada, with Laveras hiring a local crew and to shore up some in the region's oldest industry. We had a need for, for farmers and ranchers here in, in this southeast Oklahoma to a place to produce their, their goat milk. And this gives an opportunity for a small time family to come in and, and put a hundred goats in and make a profit at it. And that's the key point. We you know, don't need to do it for practice, so we need to do it for a profit. Cross Broom Farms supplies goat milk to Lavera's owner, Becky Wise. She says, uh-uh, I don't want no part of that. He had wheels of goat milk cheese, and I was just like, 
is that ours? And he said, yeah, that come from your goats. And I was like, golly, that's just awesome. It's awesome. That's my milk. That is my milk. And I helped make that product. It makes us feel so great to be able to, you know, keep them in business and uh, you're able to, you know, keep their business going by what we're doing. In one place. Oh, it's already gone. <laughs> now, if you'd like to taste Lavera's cheese, it is showing up at a number of retailers and can also be found online. This month, the greatest show on earth closes for good. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we visit Ringling, Oklahoma to see how oil, intrigue, and John Ringling Circus put this small town on the map. Anybody asked the town of Ringling, they said, Ringling? I've never heard of Ringling. I said, you always say, the circus. On Oklahoma Show Over the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here next week.